Hi, I'm Brendan, he's Grant. We have kind of weird backgrounds. Grant here spent two years in the United States Peace Corps, spreading love and peace and democracy and propaganda to uh, such far-flung places as Ghana, where he spent two years as a, a high school computer literacy teacher. I'm a lawyer, which is very weird, um, and I have a concentration, double concentration in uh, international law, spe specifically in treaties and war crimes, that kind of international law, not contracts, and criminal law. Uh, so I tend to focus on the kind of uh, crimes you really need an army of child soldiers in order to get in interested in. So as a reminder, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. If you want to figure out if something is legal or even sane, ask your lawyer. Anyway, our weird backgrounds bring us to this one conclusion. This is the old busted motto, right? John Gilmore's famous statement, the internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. And everybody says, well, this is great, right? We can use this to get around things like the Great Firewall of China or the Great Firewall of Cameron. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work. And now, of course, we have nation states that are, in, that are causing problems with the entire internet. We propose the following modification. The hacker interprets the NSA as damage and routes without it entirely. We present Endrun as a first model for this. Endrun is designed to, prevent, to present censorship-resistant communications for extremely marginalized groups. By extremely marginalized, we do not mean 16-year-old emo kids talking about how much their parents hate them on LiveJournal. We mean groups that are actively trying to be suppressed by an actual nation-state adversary. Endrun furthermore is designed to work within an existing operational security scheme. If you aren't already set up in some kind of cellular structure, if you don't have existing operational security guidelines, Endrun is not going to help you. If you don't understand what operational security is, we suggest reading any of the last three or four years of ranting by the Grug online. It's all published on his GitHub. Endrun is also not sufficient to replace trusted couriers or trusted compartmentation. Finally, as a warning, don't use this in life-critical situations. Don't use Endrun to attempt to evade your local gendarmes because you're probably going to have a bad day. Endrun is currently pre-alpha software, right? Don't trust it where you're going to get killed because then you're going to get killed. Uh, we hope that one day Endrun will be ready for use either as its own system or as providing the model for a new system that could be used in a life-critical environment. So we've made this system called Endrun. Here are the five big principles behind it. First, Endrun should use no internet connectivity at all. And this is important because you might not be able to use the internet for several different reasons. One reason is that you might not have internet connectivity due to a natural disaster, such as a tornado or a hurricane or a typhoon. You also might not have the internet due to an artificial disaster, such as a boat scraping the bottom of the Suez Canal and taking out all the fiber optic lines that connect to North Africa or a highly artificial disaster, such as Egypt voluntarily cutting itself off from the internet, or Syria involuntarily being cut off by the United States government messing up and cutting itself off from the internet. In addition, Enron is designed to be useful in places where the terrain doesn't allow for internet connectivity. While you have satellite internet covering a good chunk of the Earth, it certainly doesn't cover all of it, and it's fabulously expensive to use bidirectional satellite for most of the planet. Endrun is also by any means necessary, which is a phrase we use in amateur radio all the time. We want Endrun to be able to work with whatever communications infrastructure you have, whether that's sneaker net, and we focus a lot of time on sneaker net that is actually walking around with USB keys or other physical storage, but also things like XB, low power transmitters, sneaker net plus, which is a system we'll design, we'll talk about a little bit later, carrier pigeon, printing things out, or even using amateur radio, right? We want you to be able to use whatever you've got laying around. And while we think it's a bad idea for some, that we'll talk about in a minute to use, say, moon bounce, where you're actually using 1,500 watts of power and bouncing your signal off the moon, you could do that with Endrun. Endrun is also designed as cellular communication. This does not mean, like, can you hear me now with a Verizon cell phone. This means old school cellular resistance structures, right? It is, we want Endrun to be used within groups of people that already know each other. Endrun is not designed as a replacement for Twitter or for blogs. It is designed for people who already know each other to be able to exchange information, presumably about why they all got together. And as Brendan was saying, we want Endrun to be able to be used by marginalized groups of people in very hostile places, places where the trains don't run on time or the trains have just stopped running or even places where the track never got laid. And 
Because of that, we've made Enron delay and disruption tolerant. It's designed to work in places where there are no real or, time, or bounded time connections between different clients on the network. And because it's platform or medium agnostic, you can use it in places where the internet traditionally fails, like conflict zones, disaster areas, the north of Scotland. You know, any place where you would traditionally have trouble putting together infrastructure, Enron should work for you. Finally, Endrun is modifiable on the fly. Rather than creating an entire compendium of custom software, we designed it to use as much off open source so software off the shelf as possible. This allows two things. One, we get the advantages of all the security work being put into existing projects. But secondly, and we think more importantly, we come from an amateur radio background, where any component in your $20,000 ham radio should be able to be replaced by two alligator clips and some bailing wire without any modification into how well you can transmit. We want people to be able to modify Enron to meet their individual needs. The easiest way to do that is if it's written using something that people actually know. So it's primarily open soft soft source software glued together with a whole bunch of Python and a few other components we'll talk about. So let's talk about previous work. And to be clear, previous work in this instance means categories of previous work. We're not claiming to list every project that has ever attempted to achieve censorship resistant communication. So we're going to hit a few of the highlights. The first one everyone always talks about is Tor. And Tor, of course, is wonderful. Um, designed by the United States government as a research project, now promoted by the United States State Department and hunted down by the United States FBI, because that's how we work in the US now. Tor has a lot of great advantages. Obviously, you all know it. I won't belabor the concept of onion routing. But the two big disadvantages that it has that are currently a problem for our type of communications were discussed in the original paper by Roger Dingledine. They are first, if an adversary controls both the source and the destination of a message, they will be able to de-anonymize it. And second, if an adversary controls more than 50% of the Tor network as a whole, they will be able, they will be able to de-anonymize everything. The first one came out very dramatically earlier this year, when a young undergraduate from Harvard really, really didn't want to take his business ethics final and decided to use Tor to email in a bomb threat. Because he was sitting on the Harvard University campus and transmitting to the Harvard University mail servers, Harvard was able to look at its network logs, find the one guy who was on Tor who transmitted a burst of information at almost exactly the time the mail was received, and then they simply sent a few cops round to the child said, hey, did you happen to email in a bomb threat? He confessed instantaneously, and within four hours, not only did they figure out that there was no bomb, but they had arrested one young kid who couldn't be bothered to take his final. The second category, that is doubling the size of the Tor network in order to control it, has never been conclusively proven to have happened. That said, in the original Tor paper, it was thought this won't be a serious problem because Tor will grow as the internet grows. And so by the year 2014, there should be hundreds of thousands of Tor nodes. In fact, that hasn't happened. Currently, Tor on its own networks, any given day this month, lists around 6,000 nodes, which means you can go to Amazon, write them a check for $52,000 a month, and double the size of the Tor network overnight. Tor has some internal protections, which would prevent you from literally doing that with Amazon itself. But the general idea of you can easily double the size of the Tor network for a reasonable amount of money still applies. And unfortunately, that means that Tor is no longer resistant to nation state level attacks. In April of this year, uh, Anonymous took a stab at this problem and announced AirChat, which was their system for doing secure internet free communication using cheap little you know, 20 or 25 euro handheld amateur radios that you would then connect to your computer with USB. And this is actually based on some software that's been around in the amateur radio community for a while called FL Digi. So this has standardized components, well-supported software. It's not a new concept. This should be great, right? Well, a couple of problems here. First of all, in order to legally use amateur radio, you have to get a license from the government and tell them who you are, where you live, and what frequencies you're going to use. That's not exactly good OPSEC if you're trying to run a clandestine operation. The second issue is that under US law, and I'm guessing this is true in most places, you cannot use encryption on amateur radio, except in a couple of circumstances. If you're controlling a space station or running an RC aircraft, because you generally don't want those to fall out of the sky. So Anonymous's response to the whole, well, you can't use crypto thing was, fuck you, NSA. 
which isn't even the right agency, but whatever. The second problem is that it's, it's, this is an online protocol. It's constantly transmitting from the moment you connect to one client to the moment you're done. How many of you know what triangulation is? How many of you know what unidirectional means? If you take a couple of unidirectional antennas and a couple of strength meters and then do some math, you end up with a problem we've been calling connection reset by missile. The Japanese got really good at this during World War II in tracking down allied radio stations. And more recently, the Syrians have been accused or you know, suspected of launching missile strikes against foreign journalists who are using satellite phones by tracing the satellite phone signal. Now those phones, those satellite phones, tend to have a broadcast power of about 250 milliwatts. That 20 or 25 euro amateur radio, handheld radio, five watts. They have more than enough power to find where you are and then ruin your day. Mesh networks are another category of traditional censorship resistant systems. And we're talking about two of them here, the Commotion Wireless Project and then Project Byzantium. They're both mesh networks, but they operate in somewhat different veins. Commotion Wireless is designed for community wireless. That is, one person has an internet connection that's presumably fairly fast. You'd like to share it to the rest of an urban area then Commotion Wireless provides firmware that you put on your Linksys router and other kind of equivalent routers that create mesh and that way you share the internet connection to a whole area and you can set up an ad hoc network. Project Byzantium, by contrast, is designed for situations where there's no internet left. They actually call it mesh networking for the zombie apocalypse. And with Project Byzantium, you have apparently pre-stocked CDs loaded with the Byzantium firmware that you insert into the last five laptops in human existence that still have CD-ROM drives, and you boot them up, and the, the laptops themselves form a mesh network. Byzantium is cool because it actually provides services, so, because it's not designed to connect to the internet as a whole. So you have a basic chat server, you have a basic wiki, you have basic user-to-user -user messaging, that kind of thing, which is a good idea. The problem with both of these, the problem with mesh networks in general, is that they're going to get people killed for exactly the same reason. With either one of these, you have something transmitting at somewhere between a tenth of a watt and a whole watt, which is plenty of power, especially because it's not moving very quickly, or indeed at all, to, again, connection reset by missile. You're going to have a bad time. There are also approaches like Briar, which for those of you who haven't heard of this, Briar is a new idea for encrypted messaging that's user-to-user -user mesh networking on Android devices. It's being developed by some people who have pretty good reputations, people from the Tor and FreeChat and LimeWire projects. The issue is that it uses a single hop for its ad hoc messaging. So that is, if two users want to talk to each other and they're within range of a single hop Wi-Fi connection or single hop Bluetooth, they can chat to each other. That works really well as long as you've got a very small area and everybody's online in the app at the same time. It doesn't work for long distance communication, which Briar uses by using Tor, which as discussed above is not a good idea. It's also Android only. It simply doesn't have the flexibility we're looking for. So while it's something to watch and it could develop much more, it's still in closed alpha state. Um, it's not flexible enough just yet. Of all the prior research and all the existing stuff that we looked at, DTN is the closest to what we want to achieve. DTN, for those of you who don't know, stands for Delay or Disruption Tolerant Networking. It depends on who was funding the research. If it was DARPA, it's Disruption Tolerant Networking. If it's NASA or the European Space Agency, it's Delay Tolerant Networking. And this idea has been around for a while, actually. But the most recent sort of delve into this field was when Vint Cerf started working on something called the Interplanetary Internet in the mid-90s. This solves a lot of really interesting problems because it'll handle transient links. In, in, in the space example, if you have tr radio transmitters on opposite sides of different planets, that's a problem. It'll handle long delays because if we're trying to communicate with Mars, that's an 18 minute trip one way at the speed of light. And the speed of light is a real bitch when it comes to ping times. It'll also handle different pathways, multiple routes. If I can't contact a space probe by one path, I'll take another. And it's great. However, there are a couple of problems with this as well. Most of the research has been funded by grants from either NASA or from DARPA. And those grant funded research studies tend to re result in burst development by aerospace engineers or 
electrical engineer postgrad students who are working for a professor at a different institution every time. So there has never been a single standardized implementation of DTN. Every person who's done this has done it differently. The next problem is that security is really sort of an afterthought. All of those engineers, all of those big E engineers, EEs and aerospace engineers, tend to take the approach that you can solve any software problem by writing a crap ton of C. And as a result, these are all binary protocols. And binary protocols are really hard to parse. And as anybody in the Langsep community will tell you, if it's hard to parse, it's hard to secure. So therefore, none of the existing DTN approaches will work. But we really like the idea of DTN. It does everything we want to do. So what we did is we took the lazy hacker approach. We're going to do this, and we're going to see if we can do it using off-the-shelf and existing software, because I really don't want to write new code. So the first thing we have to figure out in terms of implementing a DTN is the network transmission protocol, right? When you're trying to set up a network protocol, you have a number of non-trivial problems. Information shows up in the wrong order. It shows up corrupted. It'll show up 20 or 30 times over. You know, it won't show up at all. You also have to worry about changes to information occurring in transit that need to be reincorporated into the whole, right? And we can't use TCP because we've got ping times that might be minutes or hours or days, right? So we drank a lot of beer. And we thought about this. And it turns out that these are the exact same problems faced by distributed software development teams. And Git does an amazing job of solving those problems. It'll handle information out of order. It'll handle information that's been corrupted. It'll handle divergent information. It's great. But I can see some of you thinking, well, wait a second. Don't I need a network connection to talk to a remote Git repository? Nope. More beer. More reading of ran man pages, which don't do that, by the way, showed us that there is an existing feature of Git called bundles that lets us fake a remote repository with a file. So what I can do is create a Git bundle, push data to it like it were a remote repo, and then copy that and move it to another computer. So I can copy it to a USB stick. I can burn it to a CD, you know, because remember those. If I'm in the United States, I can print it in six-point font and give it to a United States attorney, because you know that's another thing that we do. Anyway, once I get it to the destination, I copy the file into a place that Git knows where it is, and I do a pull, just like I were doing a pull from a remote repository. And that solves this problem of connecting to a Git repository without a network connection. It's really cool. So Git solves our problem of making in-order execution and in-order communication. It also handles a lot of corruption. What it doesn't handle is internally is security, because it's just not designed for that. So cryptographers have been telling us all for decades that abstinence is the only option, and that no mere programmer, no mere engineer is ever fit to write cryptography. Only cryptographers, they say, should write cryptography. That's awesome. Unfortunately, when asked to write libraries that the rest of us can use, they usually say, I'm extremely busy doing math stuff. So too bad, um, which is how we end up with OpenSSL being everywhere and working nowhere. Luckily, one cryptographer stands against this trend, and his name is Professor, Professor Daniel J. Bernstein of the University of Illinois at Chicago. His website is crypto, cr.yp.to. So he's quite serious about this, we promise. And he's written a uh, library called SALT, NACL being the chemical symbol for SALT. SALT works by getting rid of all of the ability to do dumb things that programmers really enjoy. Those of you who follow OpenSSL uh, configuration may know that the correct answer to verify certificates true or false is actually three if you want to actually verify the certificates. If you set it to true, it won't work, and if you set it to false, it also won't work. Salt does away with all of that. It does not allow you to downgrade its security. It will have security, and you will be happy in that it has security, or you will use a different library. That's how it works. It's very much the hard line. It is incredibly fast. It's built around all elliptic curves. It's built specifically around the ED25519 curve, which was built in a peer review process by cryptographers around the world. Um, the, it is designed to be extremely secure, and indeed, major projects with security in mind, things like the OpenDNS uh, data center to data center backbone, use it. So it's very performant. It's very well written. The problem is that Daniel J. Bernstein does not guarantee it works in any particular place other than on his own office computer. It doesn't always work even on his home computer. It is the world's least portable C code. Woo, C! <laughs> <laughs> so 
OpenDNS saw this and like, we'd really like it to work on other people's computers, for instance, other academics or other non-academics. And they wrote Libsodium, which is essentially a series of very minor changes to Salt that allow it to be portable across implementations. So Libsodium provides the whole library of Salt in C. They then wrote several bindings and the community has contributed, com contributed dozens more so that if you want to use Libsodium, you can use it whether you're writing in C, whether you're writing in Ruby or Perl, whether you're writing in something exotic like Erlang or Haskell or one of the other neckbeard languages. We can't directly encrypt the data stored in a Git repository because then Git doesn't do its Git magic. So instead we use Libsodium to do the full sign encrypt sign, which prevents you from ever having to decrypt stuff that you haven't first verified for tamper proofness and then verify that the person who encrypted it also signed the plain text, which prevents a series of different cryptographic attacks thought up by people smarter than us. So now that we've solved the network transmission protocol issue and we've solved the crypto issue, we're going to talk about how we tie it all together. We do this with something called a payload. And a payload in Enron is just a serialized package of an encrypted Git bundle with all of the information I need to get it from point A to point Z. In a payload, we have an origin and a destination node identifier, which for purposes of uniqueness, we're using a public key fingerprint from the SALT public encryption key. We have a timestamp so we can determine time to live because eventually this information will get stale. We have the contents, which is the aforementioned Git bundle. And then we have a chain of custody field and a copies field, which I will get to in a couple of slides. So if I want to provision an end run cell, let's say I want to provision eight nodes, the first thing I do is create a source repository. I, one, of the, one of the downsides to using Git is that we have to have a common origin for all of these nodes to be able to move data in, around. So we create an arbitrary uh, Git repository. We set up eight branches, one for each node in the cell. And then I set up eight bundles, one for each node in the cell. I also generate two pairs of keys for each node. So I have a signing key pair and I have an encryption key pair. Once I've done that, I can start provisioning my nodes. I'm going to talk about node one as an example here. So I would basically clone the node one bundle from the, from the common set of bundles that I've generated and copy over eight branches, one for each node, and seven bundles. So essentially everybody's bundle except my own. I then copy over the public part of those double key pairs, so the public signing key and the public encryption key for all of the other nodes, and bring over my full key pair, so the full public and private key pair for both signing and encryption. I create a SQLite database and memory for storing some ephemeral data. I set up the end run daemon, which takes care of automating all of the transmit and receive and outgoing queue and incoming queue and you know, recording data and that sort of thing, and I'm ready to operate. When I'm actually storing information on the end run node, I commit everything to the master branch of that Git repository. When I'm ready to send data, let's say from node one to node two, I would check out node two's branch, commit master to it, push that to the Git bundle, and then trigger end run to create a payload. End run then takes the payload, and through the magic of disruption tolerant networking, it shows up at node two. The end run daemon imports it, makes sure that it's, you know, make sure that all the keys work out and everything checks out. It puts the bundle in the appropriate location and then does a pull. And we merge that back into master and all the information shows up in the correct place. So now that we've described how we're going to secure the data and how we're going to store the data and generally how we're going to move it around, let's talk about user services. We don't want end run to be designed for use only by people who know how to do Git, because it turns out Git is hard. Git is hard even for people who've used version control systems. I hear the screams every day of people who use subversion <laughs> and they are suddenly forced to transition to Git. And they go, why are all these commands? Why does checkout, instead of doing what I think checkout means, actually delete all of my work? Um, wh why, what does clone mean and why does this happen, et cetera, et cetera? So for this, we tapped Gollum. For those of you who are not familiar with Gollum, Gollum is a uh, wiki built on top of Git, developed by GitHub. And it's specifically, it's the, what powers all of the GitHub-based wikis for each repository. Gollum is great because it allows us to do quite a few things. First of all, it means that normal users can now commit to a repository because all they have to do is type text in on a web page. And generally, people know how to do that these days. If they can't, they need other help first. 
It also does some intelligent resolving of merge conflicts. It can't solve everything, but generally it does the right thing more often than you'd think. We actually did some brute force testing on how well it could resolve different conflicts from using the source of all Wikipedia conflict, Wikipedia itself, and it turns out to work pretty well. A wiki, therefore, gives us a couple different types of communication. It gives us broadcast communication and it gives us discussions. So you can have things like, you know, basic forum type things. You can re-implement 4chan on top of Gollum if you really, really want to. And if you think that's the best use of your time in a conflict zone. Please don't. Please don't. It doesn't, however, give us user to user messaging. On top of that, then, we have a couple different solutions. So I've spent the last couple minutes talking about, hey, we're going to have a great and user friendly experience. And now I've put a GPG on the slide and now everyone is going, wait, what is he thinking? Okay, it's true, GPG is a bad user experience. It's not suited for non-technical users. This is becoming increasingly obvious in the security community. But the point is that once you have Gollum, you can use whatever you want to move secured text files around. And if you already have a GPG infrastructure, this works fine. For mere mortals, however, we'd recommend using something more like Minilock. Minilock, for those of you who don't know, is Nadim Kobiesi, the guy who wrote CryptoCat, his new attempt to do user-to-user -user messaging and public key cryptography, all without requiring users to do anything they're not very good at. So a user creates a strong passphrase, and then a private key and public key um, using elliptic curve cryptography are deterministically generated from the passphrase. That means that the user doesn't need to protect the secret key. The secret key is generated at runtime from the password, stored in memory only, used to decrypt a file, and then thrown away. The user can then pass around the very, very short public key string, it being an elliptic curve, to other people who want to encrypt it. So essentially you encrypt a file to a user by way of encrypting a file to a password, but without having to have shared passwords. These are just two suggestions. You can use anything you want. The point is that once you have a wiki, you have user-friendly ways of doing messaging, both broadcast messaging and user-to-user -user messaging. Now we'd like to talk about how Endrun and DTN in general actually do the, the routing work. So when we're talking about normal networks, normal packet switch networks, we try to find the shortest path from point A to point B and then move data that way. DTNs do something different. They do something called pairwise communication, where I'm not looking for the fastest way to get there, I'm looking for the closest person to me to move the data. This is one of the reasons we bundle everything together, or we put everything together in a payload with all the routing information we need. So in this example, if I'm trying to move data from node one to node four, I have to talk to node two first, because node two is the closest node in the network. And then node two moves a payload to node three, and node three to node four. It's this So this is an, a good example of how this works. Think about a simpler time, you know, a, a happier time. You're in a classroom, you're maybe 13. There's somebody in the back of the room that you want to pass a note to. So you tear out a piece of notebook paper, write your message, fold it up, and write the name of the person on it. You then hand it to the person behind you who is then responsible for getting it to the back of the classroom. This is an example of pairwise communication. Um, Another thing that DTNs do differently from packet switch networks is something called store and forward. And in the classroom passing note example, this is what happens when the teacher turns around. You don't want to get caught passing a note because you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So you hold on to it until they turn back around and start writing stuff on the board again. That's exactly what store and forward is. You just hold on to the, the data that you're trying to transmit until it's an opportune time to do so. There are some issues with this, and there are some different methodologies that you can use to get that data from point A to point B. You can write one copy of the note and pass it to a person, or you can write multiple copies of the note and pass them to lots of people. In DTN terminology, this would be called replication and forwarding-based messaging. Forwarding being one copy, and replication or epidemic networking being multiple copies to multiple people. If I'm sending one copy, I don't have any sort of guarantee that the message will actually get to its intended recipient. If I'm sending multiple copies, I run into a really bad network congestion problem where everybody is spending all of their time trying to pass one message. Neither of these are appealing, so I spent some time looking at different options and we found some research done by a group of people at the University of Southern California called Spray and Wait. Spray and Wait combines the forwarding-based routing idea 
with a limit on the maximum number of messages that you can transmit. So you get the benefits of forwarding-based routing with the benefits of epidemic routing. So in this example, I'm trying to move data from the yellow node to the red node. And what I do is I set a maximum number of copies of eight. So then in the first round of transmission, the yellow node tries to send to as many nodes as it can find up to eight copies. The second round, all of the nodes that have a copy of the message say, OK, the ceiling is eight, and we've already done one round of transmission. So what we're going to do is cut that in half. So I'm only going to send four copies. And if it's an odd number, you round down. So we're sending out four copies in the next transmission. Third round, we send out two because, you know, eight divided by two divided by two is four. And in the fourth round, we only send out one copy. This is what we would refer to as wait mode. We hold on to that last copy of the message and wait to see if we can either make direct contact with the recipient or the time to live expires, in which case we just throw the message away. But as you can see here, we were able to make contact by two different pathways. So the system works in terms of getting the data to its intended recipient in a reasonable amount of time. And you can play with things like the, the maximum number of, you know, copies and the time to live. There's another issue that occurs in disruption tolerant networking that we don't have in packet switch networks, which is related to having global knowledge. Generally in a packet switch network, you have a global routing table so you know how to contact other people on that network. With disruption tolerant networks, you generally don't. And this leads to some serious issues. A node can go a very long time between being compromised and when you realize that compromise. Your bandwidth is a very precious resource, and you can waste a lot of it trying to contact a node that's either you know, out of service or is no longer in the area or that has been otherwise compromised. And finally, to address your question, I can only send data to people I know exist. And so if I don't know that somebody is around, I can't give data to them. And we handle this in end run using, well, in G DTN generally, using something called chain of custody. In end run, we implement this in three parts. We have a field on the payload, you know, the chain of custody field. And then we have two tables that exist on every node. We have a receipts table and a chain, uh, sorry, a map table. The chain of custody field on the nodes consists of a timestamp of when a payload was received, the identifier of the node that received it, and a hash of what the payload looked at, the entire payload looked like at the time that it was received. And every time that we receive, that a payload moves from one node to another, we append that entry to the end of the array. So this is just a, basically an array of receipts. The receipt table is storing the same information, but it's only for that node it's only for the receipts that that node issues. So essentially, we're keeping a carbon copy of every receipt so that I can go back and compare and see when something changed in transit. The final thing that we do is record every time we make contact with a new node. So every time I receive data from a node, I make an entry in the table with a timestamp and that node's identifier. And before I move stuff out of the transmission queue, I look at that table and say, OK, I've seen node one, node two, and node four in the last six hours, but I haven't heard from node three in quite a while. So I'm not going to try and send data till node three until it makes contact with me again. Because we have the, that data in the chain of custody, and particularly in the map table, we can do something called intermediate routing. One of the limitations of the original end run specification was that we could only talk to other nodes in a given cell. There was no way for people to talk to anyone that they didn't have a key for. And that's very self-limiting in terms of utility. What the end run daemon does now is when it receives a payload, it sees if it has a key for it. And if it doesn't have a key for it, it immediately shunts it into the outgoing queue. And what that allows us to do is move data across other cells. So in theory, if I had a high enough time to live, and a high enough limit on the number of copies, I could generate an end run cell and then take two nodes and move them across a city or a province or even a country and move data between those two nodes using other cells. So that allows us to get around the problem of intermediate routing. 
So we're going to use an example provided by a lecturer at the University of Southern, or the University of California at Santa Cruz, uh, Tom Lehrer, uh, to, to show how this works in a large-scale organization. So what you have here is the nodes are represented by circles. The people um, connecting to them are represented by the blocks. And which uh, person connects to which node is represented by the color of the person. So if you have a, uh, the core node in yellow in the center there, you have a variety of different people, Tom and Agnes and Jim and Louise and Harry and Marie, all connect to the yellow node. And they tend to exchange data with each other using the yellow node. Then we have couriers that pass data between nodes. And in uh, larger operational security guidelines, these couriers would, ide would ideally only the, know the locations of their two nodes, not any of the other nodes in the network. So yellow is connected to blue via Tom, who can go and talk to all of the blue people on the left. And he could speak directly to the blue nodes. That is, Tom would take, for instance, a sneaker net packet, put it on a USB key, and move it over to the blue node where it'd be dropped in. Joan, who's a member of the green node, runs connections between green and yellow. Pierre, who's a member of the white node, runs connections between white and green. Francois runs connections to the red. Jacques runs connections to blue. On the top, we have an intermediate routing node. So we have Hubert who does not actually have keys for any of these color nodes. He's a member, he speaks the end-run protocol, but do, isn't part of this uh, set of resistance cells. So he's an intermediate routing, but he can connect to the pink node, and he's able to connect to the yellow node as well, again, just to drop these packets in. So anything coming from the pink nodes on the uh, center right would be transmitted to Hubert. Hubert can then pass the data along without ever being able to decode it himself. So Hubert isn't a member of this information sharing encoded in the rest of the groups. So now that we've kind of covered the basics of routing and how end run works, I want to talk a bit about transport options. Oh, sorry. Andrew Tannenbaum once said that you should never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes. And one of the cool things about the times that we live in is that the station wagons and the tapes have gotten incredibly small. I've got a two gigabyte USB thumb drive in my hand here. It's about three centimeters in length, it weighs probably about 10 grams, if that. And it would probably cost about one or maybe two euro if you were to go buy it in a shop. I can put two gigabytes of storage in here, or two gigabytes of data, which is more books than I've ever read in my entire lifetime, put it in my pocket, and walk down the street, and nobody's the wiser as to what I'm carrying. From an operational security standpoint, this is amazing. It's cheap, it's disposable, because if I lose it, it's cheap. It's high capacity, and it's very easy to hide. So one of the reasons that we built SneakerNet as the core, the core uh, transport method for end run is because it's, from a very, it's very good from an operational security standpoint. The other reason is that USB really is universal. You would be hard pressed to find a computer manufactured in the last decade that didn't have at least one USB port. I could theoretically take data from my laptop, walk up to an old Dell from 2006, and put the USB key in and read the data, which means that you can run and run on any machine that will still boot. That's very important if you're someplace that doesn't get shipments of new computers on a weekly basis. We handle and run. In Android, we handle SneakerNet in two ways. There's a manual mode and an automatic mode. Manual is pretty much exactly what you think. You plug the disk in, you open up a terminal or you SSH into the node, and then you run a command, depending on whether you're transmitting or receiving. That's pretty standard. If you want more of a automatic dead drop USB data transfer experience, we also support that. You have to change a couple of configuration options, but what it allows you to do is set the end run daemon to watch for any USB storage that's mounted on the machine or that shows up on the machine. It will then automatically mount the disk and pull off any payloads and you know, either import them or put them in the outgoing queue. It then also looks for a text file in the root of the, of the disk that contains a list of identifiers. Those are identifiers that this US key, USB key and by extension the owner has access to. So it will automatically generate payloads for those nodes, dump them on the disk, and then unmount it. So essentially what you can do is plug in a disk, wait you know, until you get some sort of signal, and then pull the disk out, and you have all the data that you need to, to move around. 
And just to be clear, we've been talking about USB, but this works with any file storage method. So while Grant has a one or two euro, two gigabyte USB drive in his hand, you could easily drop three or 400 euros, put 128 gigabytes on a micro SD card the size of your pinky nail, which opens up different things. The point of using the file storage like this is it allows you to trade off space versus cost versus other considerations. We also support XB because, frankly, in the days of bad USB, it's getting a little scary to touch any USB ports anymore. XB, for those of you who don't know, is a brand name. It's a brand name created by Digi International, uh, and it's basically a brand name for radios. What it does is actually kind of special, and there's a reason that these are well beloved in the maker community. XB gives you a single unified form factor. It's a trapezoid, just over one square centimeter. And within that form factor, it allows you to choose power, frequency band, and protocols. So you can, pick, you can pick any power of transmission between 10 milliwatts and 250 milliwatts. You can pick any frequency band between 400 megahertz commercial bands, um, the 900 megahertz American ISM band, the 800 megahertz European ISM band, or 2.4 gigahertz. And you can pick different protocols on top of that, like in 2.4 gigahertz, you can have Wi-Fi or Zigbee or 802.15.4 without the Zigbee extensions. Below that, you can have either uh, proprietary XB designed mesh networks or open mesh networking standards, or simply point to multipoint broadcasting. And then it presents all of these things as a serial interface. So with Enrun, we've designed in a serial daemon that simply looks for a serial port that you've configured and then pushes data into it. And XB basically handles all the rest. And we talked before about our general reticence to use high-powered online protocols for wireless transmission. But we want to be able to have some way to do wireless. XB is a good trade-off for this because not only can you transmit with extremely low power, 10 milliwatts or a tenth the power of a normal Wi-Fi connection, but more importantly, it's a unidirectional protocol. So you can conceivably get up, you know, climb up to the top of a tree, broadcast, hope the other party has received the packet in a few seconds, and then leave the tree before the inevitable missile comes streaking in for you. You may want to run fast. The idea then is that if you have nodes you can't physically touch for whatever reason, you can use transient wireless links that are one directional as opposed to online links that stay in one place for a long period of time, which makes it more likely to be compatible with existing operational security. Along the same lines, we have what we call SneakerNet Plus. And SneakerNet Plus takes advantage of something that everybody is carrying around their mobile phone. So SneakerNet Plus works the same conceptual way as SneakerNet does, by carrying around its data on flash storage. The difference is that each end run node, in this case, runs a small wireless point. And this is not long range Wi-Fi transmission, this is Wi-Fi transmission for about five feet, using a teensy little uh, Wi-Fi antenna, about a quarter of a square centimeter. What happens then is when a user with a mobile phone connects to an end run node, they, uh, they are presented with a web page that says, hey, where would you like to go today? Um, and they simply type in which identifiers they're going to, that is, which other nodes they're likely to visit in the, in the future. Those bundles are then generated and deposited in the mobile phone's HTML5 web storage. And the cool thing about HTML5 web storage is that not only does every modern mobile device support it, but also it can be read by any other uh, computer sitting on the same domain. Every end run presents on its internal interface the same IP address. So when the user visits another end run node, they, they connect up, the end run node can already see what bundles they have sitting in storage and what bundles and what uh, excuse me, nodes they're willing to visit and can give them additional bundles or pull bundles out as necessary. So you have all the advantages of not needing to touch the device, but all of the also advantages of never underestimating the power of bringing around flash storage. And finally, we wanted to, to make sure that you could use any system that you wanted to use with Enron, because in certain circumstances, your options for available technology are limited. So like Brendan mentioned, XB supports serial, and the Enron daemon implements Pi serial, which basically lets you throw data at a named pipe, and it will just do its thing. So because we're supporting Pi Serial, and because we already support Serial for communication with a radio device, we just broadened it a little bit and made it so that you can use the end run daemon to talk to any Serial device. So conceivably, if you can hook up a radio to either Serial or USB, you can talk to it. You could use a null modem cable if you really wanted to, but you're not limited in your options in terms of what radios you can connect. Especially because when you consider things like amateur radio terminal node controllers, these are designed to take serial data and shoot it out over a radio. So there's a lot of stuff that's already on the market. Again, it's 
against the rules in, in amateur radio to use it almost everywhere on the planet, but there are obviously, as exemplified by anonymous, people who don't care. So now we're going to talk about future work, and we're going to start with additions to the end run protocol. One of the things that I've been thinking about in the last couple of days is key rotation and revocation. The more that you use a private key pair, the more information you accumulate and the easier it is to compromise identity and compromise information if that node ever gets captured. So one of the things I want to work on for future versions of Enron is to allow for remote key rotation or revocation. You can currently do this with Enron. You would just have to touch every node in the cell to do it, and that gets kind of cumbersome. Similarly, we contain all the information we need to do any sort of auditing within the chain of custody, but you would also have to do that by hand. There is no tool that lets you do a trace route or look at logs. So one of the things that we would like to do in future versions of Enron is build that tool. We also want to add Bluetooth beaconing. You may not have heard of this, or you might have. You might not be. You might not be remembering. Apple calls this iBeacon, and everyone else calls this Blee beaconing. What it is is very simple. You have a Bluetooth node that just periodically says, "I'm here. This is my number." And then the idea is either with iBeacon or with Android Blee beaconing, an application listens for those Bluetooth packets. Doesn't require pairing. It's not that kind of Bluetooth. And then does something intelligent. This is set up for, for instance, a museum. You might have a blee beacon next to the gift shop and a blee beacon next to a statue of a tyrannosaur. And when you go to the dinosaur, uh, the blee beacon says, you're here. And then the application will do something interesting, like display you information about the tyr Tyrannosaurus Rex and why it's there. When you go to the gift shop, it might then display advertising. But it only happens if you have a native app. What we'd like to use Blee Beaconing for is upgrading SneakerNet to a completely user inter interaction free experience. So conceptually, you'd have an iOS or Android or whatever app that would listen for these beacons. When it hears the beacon, it goes, OK, I know that that is a node. I'll connect to it over Wi-Fi and then exchange data with it. I'll say, I'm going to these nodes. I'm not going to these other nodes. Give me the bundles, or here are some bundles I have. And then disconnect, all automatically and all triggered by Blee Beaconing. The advantage of this is that, again, this is something that's carried around by the majority of people on the planet. As smartphones penetrate the rest of the world, everybody will have a phone that is capable of doing this. You could conceptually then have a completely hands-free end run experience or completely human-free end run experience by strapping a mobile phone that's capable of doing this to the top of, say, a bus. And as the bus drives around a city, it can get in contact with end run nodes without ever having to have any individual user interaction. Finally, we're going to talk about two applications we've set out for Enron. One is long distance death systems. I'm a big fan of stealing ideas from science fiction with citation. So in Charles Strauss's Neptune's Brood, he sets out uh, the idea of extremely long distance, that is many light years, many light centuries, death systems. And essentially they work by trading favors in exchanges whenever anybody goes from A to B. We'd like to set out a replacement for the hackerspace passport idea, which was a really cool idea that everybody could belong to one global hackerspace. And what it turned out to actually be was we have a couple stamps in a paper booklet that nobody really cares about. Conceptually, you could set up a system of favors that, you know, hackerspace X, to which I belong, might owe me five favors, whether that's for services rendered or paying my dues or whatever. When I go to hackerspace Y, I could bring with it an end run payload that says, hey, Hackerspace X has said they owe me five favors. Y can then extend credit in favors or money, it doesn't really matter, to me, and then set up its own exchange rate the next time it has a Y member visit Hackerspace X. Conceptually, you can do this with a lot of different methods. We'd like to, to, to build it on top of Enron because it provides a different model conceptually than just yet another thing on the Bitcoin blockchain. And finally, we want to talk about the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is surveillance. Surveillance is an important part of any you know, oppressive dictatorship regime. It's also very important for modern policing. And one of the stand by, or one of the steadfast technologies of surveillance is closed circuit television. Closed circuit television is being deployed everywhere. If you look at London, the Ring of Steel is an example of how you have ubiquitous surveillance using CCTV. However, it's very infrastructure intensive and it's non-trivial to set up. We're talking about you know, thousands of cameras and, you know, bazillions of miles of coax being run to a centralized command and control location. And if you have a location that is difficult to connect via coax or, 
just won't work in terms of running your infrastructure out that far, you can't surveil it. So if I were evil dictator overlord, what I would do is set up a camera on an end run node to dump all the surveillance data. And then the next time I jackbooted thugs would drive around in the, you know, the Land Rover or Hummer or whatever suitably evil car I pick, they have their end run node on board, which will pull the surveillance data off of that node. And when they get back to the bunker headquarters, they dump all the data into a centralized storage. This isn't real time surveillance. We're talking about a delay of hours or days. But if all I'm trying to do is figure out who kicked the old lady in the street or who burned down party headquarters, I can still identify people based on that surveillance footage, which is more important for policing anyway. But amusingly, it's less effective if you're, what you're trying to do is corral protests in real time, for instance. In general, it gives you all the right trade-offs and decreases your infrastructure commitment. So this is the end of our presentation. The photo credits are what just blinked past. And we've got a couple minutes. We'll take a couple questions if people have them.